when um, Reverend Georgia asked me if I would speak today, first thing I did was go looking for what do I want to talk about and do I have a story that goes with it. So I figured out what I wanted to talk about, but couldn't find a story. So I'm telling this story, even though it has nothing to do with my talk. <laughs> so an older gentleman was on the operating table awaiting surgery and his younger son was going to do the surgery because that's what the father requested. Now, just before the surgery began, the uh, father called his son over and he said, son, listen, I want to tell you, do the very best that you can. Don't worry about it. And if anything should happen to me, if anything should go wrong, your mother's coming to live with you. I don't know how science of mind that is, but. <clears throat> and I was so happy this morning when uh, Virginia started the uh, praise singing and she was talking about happiness because I have to tell you that of late, happiness has just been creeping in. And sometimes I think, why am I so happy? I know it's not a sickness, but it feels like it sometimes. I'm just overjoyed, and I'm extremely glad that it is happening. And um, so I thought to myself, I wonder how many times we've said to ourselves or to someone, look how happy I am, and it's not even the weekend. How good is that? Or things weren't really going all that good, and then happiness just came right into my life. Anybody here know that feeling? Tell me, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> but truly, I am interested in spontaneous happiness, unexpected, out of nowhere, moments of joy. All right, that's, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> because this gives us, uh, gives us wonderful times when we can absolutely forget about our bills, our pains, our worries, even our kids. <laughs> Anything that would cause our, <laughs> okay now, don't forget about them that long. <laughs> so anything that would cause our heart to be held hostage would just be suspended for that time. Now I wondered what it be, would be like if that was just a flash, but what would it be like if it just went on and on and on? Well. I thought I would start by asking you three questions today. And the first one is, what if? What if nothing in our life means what we think it means? And what if everything in our life could be understood in a different way? And three, what if our prayers are being answered and we are unwilling or unable to accept those answers? A few years ago, when I was minister in the Eureka Center for Spiritual Living, I did a series on different religions of the world. And I think the one thing that stood out for me, not is how different we are, but how, how we are absolutely intertwined in, in the same beliefs. The common threads are absolutely there, and I love finding them. That series absolutely expanded my thinking and made me know that narrow thinking absolutely hampers spiritual growth. So when I already know it all, when I have already done it all, when I know what it's supposed to be like and I know what to expect, then there is no room for growth and expansion, is there? You see, life is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to grow and to learn. Now, when I was in the School of Ministry, I know it was several years ago, but we had really many, many good teachers. But this one stood out, and he taught us some things that I never have forgotten. He was actually part of the founding uh, group of this philosophy and was trained by our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes. And his name is Dr. Richard Leo. And he said, life is absolutely an opportunity to learn and to grow. And he would challenge us by saying things like, I have this philosophy, and it's called the 3D axiom of life. Does anyone know what that is? Well, of course, we had no idea what he was talking about. But his axiom of life went like this. 
Don't die dumb. <laughs> Excuse me? I've been on this planet a little while. I think I know a few things. But of course, of course, that statement coming at us and our fellow students, we thought, well, we didn't even hear him right. That couldn't be possible. But he did have a point. And his point was that whether or not we ended up being what he called dumb depended on how we live our lives. And to him, had, dumb had nothing to do with stupid or any of those ideas that might come into your mind. Dumb meant narrow, unwilling to see another viewpoint. To him, it meant to stay with the same, never willing to move forward. And his answer to wondering if we were going to die dumb was something like, if our attitude is, I have already tried that, or you just don't know what I'm dealing with, or that's the way it is, or I know exactly what to expect, or I've already done that and it doesn't work. <gasps> Nobody can relate to that. So I'm wondering how many of us in this room have traveled the United States? Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty neat place, isn't it? Well, you may or may not know that this past May, uh, my sisters and I drove across the United States. And we have always wanted to do that. So we packed our bags, we loaded the car, and away we went. Yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> We live in an absolutely beautiful and diverse country. But do you know how far it is to Florida? <laughs> wow. <laughs> we saw many, many states, and just to name a few, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, and we finally got to Florida. Now, some of the differences that we saw was the freeways. I think we were mostly on 80, I can't remember. We're on so many roads. Anyway, the freeways are tree-lined on both sides and often right down the middle as well. Now, I'll grant you, it makes for a beautiful, beautiful ride, but it didn't allow us to see much of the countryside. And that's not a complaint, I promise you. It's ju it was just an interesting observation for me. We did leave the freeway plenty of times to do some touristy stuff, so I'll just tell you about a couple of things. Of course, we had to go to Graceland. <laughs> Doesn't everybody in my generation know about Graceland and Elvis Presley? It was fabulous. We had a great time. We also stopped in a town called Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And we didn't even realize it till we were there on their little tram tour that this was a place which we knew, that's why we went there, that our mother was born there, but she was born there 100 years ago this year. And for as long as I can remember, our mom told us stories about Eureka Springs. And as we were on this tram taking this tour, all three of us looked at each other and thought, this town has hardly changed. I mean, we recognized all these different places that were on the tour. It was wonderful. We also spent a few days in Branson, Missouri, and we saw some shows, and if you haven't been there, they were amazing. Now, all of our <coughs> tourism travels were wonderful. However, our greatest discovery, now don't laugh at me, was the differences in food. And, you know, our family moved from Ohio to California in 1947. And all our life, we thought we were eating what was called Midwestern food. My mom always told us that's the way she cooked. Now, I will admit that I am a vegetarian, and that takes a bit of a special diet. And, a, you know, regular restaurants don't always have a lot, but I never find a problem finding something to eat. Do you know what they serve in the Midwest? <laughs> meat and potatoes, you got it. <laughs> if it isn't meat and potatoes, it isn't food and they don't have it. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> However, at almost every restaurant, they had what they called side dishes, vegetable side dishes. So I thought, well, this is terrific. I'll just order some side dishes. Well, then I looked under the offering of side dishes, and here are their vegetable dishes. 
macaroni and cheese, <laughs> mashed potatoes, French fries, sweet potato fries, <laughs> applesauce, but they always had green beans and corn. I ate a lot of green beans and corn. <laughs> it was very different. And my first thoughts, believe it or not, were, why don't they get with it? Why don't they serve the kind of food that I'm used to eating? And then I realized I was traveling away from my home, away from my environment, <sighs> into a different way of life. And I knew that what I wanted and what I expected was for them to change their way of eating to my way. Just while I was there would have been okay. <laughs> you see, I was waiting for everything to be changed for me. But life doesn't work that way. If I want things to change, I may be the one who needs to start the change. And it reminded me of what Norman Vincent Peale said. Prayer does not change things for me. It changes me for things. Amen. Amen. Yes. So if I want to have a different experience, I may need to get a different perspective. It may be up to me to change. I had to face the fact that I was not going to get my veggie dishes and my veggie burgers in the Midwest. If we want our life to be different, we are the one who needs to do the changing. And then at a deeper level, at a cellular level, it occurred to me that this may just be the way I expect God to be. It may be the source of my unrequited fulfillment. So I had to ask myself, do I expect God to step in and save me, rescue me, while at the same time, don't demand things of me. I just want you to make my life the way I want it. Well, when I am in that mode of thinking, I am not seeing God for the way God is, am I? Because I'm insisting that it should be another way and it should be my way. Now I know for me that if I don't challenge my boundaries, and if I don't put myself in new surroundings, and if I don't communicate with other people, and if I don't find anything or read anything new, then I am not allowing my environment in front of me to change and transform. And if I am not willing to do any of this, how is God supposed to reveal the very thing that I say that I want to be different? Now, when we decide to do things different, we want to remember that there can be some risks. There can be warnings all over, and I think we see warnings on labels all the time, right? So, just for fun, I found some labels. Here we go. On a propane blowtorch, it says, never use while sleeping. <laughs> this is true. I didn't make it up. On a vacuum cleaner, it says, do not use to pick up anything that is burning. <laughs> and a Batman costume. Warning, cape does not enable user to fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't colored my hair for many years, but I was surprised to see this on a bottle of hair color. Do not use this as an ice cream topping. I don't think it tasted too good. <laughs> and just one more. On a stroller, remove infant before folding. <laughs> I didn't make them up, I promise you. <laughs> but you know, no matter how long I have been around metaphysics, there may be some part of me that once in a while reverts to thinking that God is like the big daddy in the sky. There may be some part of me that thinks I can ask and God will step in with whatever I am asking for. All the while, all the while that God is right here, who is animated and speaking and watching and listening, but is paralyzed because my, because I am waiting for 
God to produce, and God is waiting for me to get out of the way. You know, I used to have this habit, and I guess it turned a lot of people off. I stood with my arms closed and a scowl on my face. I don't know why it turned people off. <laughs> Fortunately, I have a sister who loves me enough to tell me, with your arms folded and a scowl on your face, people are really turned off. Well, I used to do that when I was thinking or I was concentrating. And so I wondered at the time, can I change this? I mean, this is who I am. That's how I stand. But guess what? I decided that if it turned people off and I wanted to be in the ministry, I needed to find a way to stand. I needed to know that there could be another way to be. Amen. Amen. Thinking of other ways to be. In 1968, the Swiss had 85% of the world's wristwatch market. In 1978, they had 75%. In 1990, they had 5% of the market, and the Japanese had 95%. Now, I think we've probably all heard of the quartz crystal. Well, as it turns out, the quartz crystal is much more accurate in the wristwatch business. But this technology, which was discovered by the Swiss, was rejected by them. In fact, they sold the crystal rights to a Japanese firm. The successful world clock makers said, that's not the way we make watches. Ever heard these words? That's the way we always do it. Ever heard these words? Change your thinking, change your life. Well, I know that for me, and I'm sure for each person here, there is an emerging vision in our life. And it may not even be clear yet what it is. It may be just an impulse at this time. And so we look at it and we say, hmm, is that the way I want to do my life? How many times? How many times have I rejected divine guidance because I wanted to do it my way? Let us be willing to see more rather than be constricted. In this process, we can ask ourselves those same three questions that I started with. What if nothing in my life means what I think it means? What if everything in my life could be understood in a different way? And what if my prayers are being answered now, but I am unable or unwilling to listen? So perhaps this week, we can bring some new aliveness to our life. Maybe we could read a new book or glean a new idea. We could have a practitioner with us pray with us after service. Maybe do something that we don't usually do. There is no limit to this thing called God. In the, in the different religions, the common denominator is always God. Religious science, Islam, Taoism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, and Paganism. And I do believe in our beautiful song that we sing in the earlier service, let there be peace on earth, and it must begin with me. So if I want my world to be different, it starts right where I am. And I can start by turning within. So let's do that right now and turn within and take this message into prayer. So as we turn within, let us know that the one divine creator is right here right now absolutely working with us, through us, and as us. And I know that as each one of us step out into this week and we make a declaration of how we want our life to unfold, that beautiful divinity within us absolutely guides and guards and, and directs every action that we take. And with God and each and every one of us, all things unfold in divine right order. Divine right action is in process right now as I speak this word 
And I know that this is a blessed week, a blessed day, a blessed time for each and every one of us. And so I simply give thanks and release this to the divine law of mind, knowing that it is done, it is complete, and so it is.